Well, once again, we're delighted that you've joined us for week one of our Easter trilogy. And uh, this year's trilogy is entitled No Other Name. For three weeks, we're going to talk about why Jesus Christ, his name, is indeed that name that's above every other name. Easter Sunday, we're going to talk about the resurrection. Next weekend is all about the sacrifice that Jesus made. But today we're going to talk about the life and the ministry of Jesus. How many of you received one of these year invited cards when you walked in? Do you all get one of these? Um, if you did, and um, how many of you are a rebel and you already opened it up? <laughs> you sinners, you wretched sinners. Well, hang on to it because uh, you're going to uh, be able to still enjoy the benefits of that a little bit later on in the service. Let me start with a question here today. What is the gospel that Jesus came to preach? The word gospel means good news. What is the good news that Jesus came to preach? A lot of people don't know the answer to that question. So maybe a few verses from the Bible will help us understand what the gospel that Jesus came to preach was. Here it is. Here's the first scripture. Let's read together loud and strong. Ready? One, two, three, go. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Next verse. Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. One more. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. So if you were to answer that question, what is the good news that Jesus came to preach, you would say it's all about the kingdom of God. Jesus came to proclaim that God's kingdom has now come to planet Earth. And ordinary people like you and I can live in it and walk in it if we want to. Now, if you were to ask a rabbi in Jesus' day, what is the main symbol for the kingdom of God? They would respond by saying, well, it's, it's like a feast or a big banquet. In fact, Isaiah chapter 25 says this, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich foods for all people. A banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. So if you were to ask a rabbi in Jesus' day what the main symbol for what heaven looks like, the kingdom of God, they would say, it looks like a feast. It looks like a giant banquet. And so we have this table here to remind us of what it is to live in the kingdom of God. It's like a big banquet or a feast. Now, there's something that Jesus did. Oh, by the way, what a feast this is. We have these wonderful lemon bars here. Mm. Well, those are good. Um, we have turkey. We have potato salad, asparagus. We have all these fruits and salads. And so I, I'm going to do something, okay? Um, I, I'm the priest of this house, you know, the pastor of this house. So I'm going to perform a priestly act on all of your behalf. Jesus kept doing something that got him into a lot of trouble. So while you all read what it is that got Jesus in trouble, read about it on the screen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my priestly duties and I'm going to have a meal while you read about what it was that got Jesus in trouble. Are, are you with me on this? Okay. So they're going to put the scripture up on the screen right now. And when I count to three, you're going to read and I'm going to eat and you're going to find out what it was that got Jesus in trouble. Ready? One, two, three, go. While Jesus, mm. Mm. Oh, next verse. <laughs> One, two, three, go. Mm. Keep reading. (laughs) 
So what was it that got Jesus into so much trouble? Who he ate with? He ate with sinners and publicans. They say, well, why is this such a big deal? I'll tell you why this was a big deal to the Pharisees and religious establishment of the day. Because who you ate with was, you know, part of, it, was, it was a social statement. It meant they were part of my community. Do you know that there was actually a group of, there was actually a word for uh, the group of people that Jesus hung out with? They were called the Amhar Arats. Literally, it means the common people of the day, the common people of, of the area. And so these were people who didn't, they didn't honor the scriptures. They didn't care about God. They were just living their lives. They were coloring outside the lines, using all kinds of foul language, sleeping in wrong beds. You know, we all know the type. Jesus hung out with these people. He enjoyed hanging out with these people. And so the Pharisees and religious establishment said, how can you, you claim to be holy and righteous, but you're hanging out with all the wrong kinds of people. And furthermore, you're eating with them. For sure you wouldn't eat with them because that was a matter of saying that they were in, involved in your community. See, who ate with whom was a social statement. Sort of like when I was in high school. This is way back in the dark ages, okay? Uh, when I was in high school, at the high school cafeteria, there was a certain table where the elite sat. You know, the jocks and the cheerleaders. And then there was another table where people like, like this sat. All right? <laughs> Does the word dweeb come to mind? All right? Now, can, can you imagine a little dweeb walking across the lunchroom and sitting down at the jocks table? Everybody would be saying, like, what are you doing? Don't you know that dweebs and jocks don't mix? Well, friends, multiply that dynamic by about a thousand times because in Jesus, to eat, in Jesus' day, to eat with someone made a statement. You were saying that you are a part of my community. And it would be unthinkable for a righteous man to sit down and have a meal with one of these people of the land, the common people, the dweebs. See, Pharisees, they were very pious. They had a very strict order. First, somebody had to repent of their sins. Then they, uh, they purified themselves. Then they became holy. And then you could fellowship with them. Then you could eat with them. But you would never, if you were religious or righteous, you would never sit down with someone until first they repented, purified themselves, and became holy. But along comes Jesus. Don't you love Jesus? And he messes up the whole religious order because he has fellowship with them first. He actually invites dweebs to sit at the jock's table. And he believes that by fellowship with him first, that they're going to see his kind of life. His life was so contagious that they're going to want to repent and follow him because they want his kind of life so badly. And Jesus invites them to his table, not out of ignorance, but on purpose. Not once in a while, but day after day after day. And keep in mind that Jesus was a prophet. And prophets didn't just teach like I'm doing. They performed symbolic acts that got in people's faces. So every time Jesus sat down with sinners to eat, it was a parable. Every time he sat down with this, this riffraff and had a meal, he was making a statement. And his statement was to all the religious people of the day, God's kingdom has now come to earth. And I'm in charge of the guest list. And I invite all people, no matter who they are and what they've done, I invite all people to sup at my table. They can come just the way they are. See, here's the deal about the Pharisees. They had a list a list in their heart of people that they thought mattered to God and people they thought didn't matter to God. They had a list in their mind of people that they thought counted and then those that they thought didn't count. And the truth is, most of us here today, we also have a list, whether we're honest about it or not. Most of our hearts look like this. We have a great big heart of love for certain people, right? You know, like our spouse or our kids maybe our parents, maybe our friends. When we see them, we have these great feelings of love and, and warmth. But the truth is, most of us also have another list in our heart, maybe an ex-business partner or an ex-spouse. But For some people, it gets even a little bit darker because some people don't like groups of people. Some people are disgusted with certain ethnic groups or people who don't believe like they believe or vote like they vote or people of different lifestyles. You know, there was a famous... Christian television pastor 
who spoke to the nation every, every week on national television, and he would commonly refer to Ellen DeGeneres as Ellen the Degenerate. And he was just disgusted with gays and lesbians. He wasn't afraid to acknowledge that on public television. As far as he was concerned, all gays and lesbians should be voted off the island, never be seen again, because they were on his list. If we could put your insides up on the screen today, most of our insides would look like that. People we love, and then people that, for whatever reason, we disdain. And Jesus recognized that this is what the Pharisees were doing. This is what the religious people were doing. And so he decides to tell a story. And uh, we want to tell you this story in a modern day setting today, the way we feel Jesus might tell a story if he were living here today. So check this out. Chop, chop, places, people, let's move it. All right, let's set the head table up here. Good. Guest tables go up in here. One, two, three, four. Ladies, begin setting glasses and silverware. Good. Cue the chandelier. Ooh, I love that. It's so theatrical. The phantom of the opera is here, inside my... Sir. I don't mean to interrupt your theatrical fantasy. I could have been a star, you know. Hollywood, Broadway, ooh, the cruise ships, the life of the party. But alas, here I am planning other people's parties. Life is cruel, no? Purple or blue napkin, sir? This is a party being thrown by the wealthiest man in town. Purple, duh, you. Are you the dinner music? Perfect. Follow me. Tonight must be perfection. You must tickle the ivories with musical strains as to enhance the ambiance of the room. Do you know anything from the Phantom? Ugh. Sir, how many settings at each table? Six or eight? Check the guest list, Miranda. Ugh. Must I do everything around here? You don't seem to do anything. Oh, darling, how are you? How is Mr. Berkshire's lovely assistant? Wonderful, thank you, Pierre. Ooh, I just love your Swedish accent. Almost as fabulous as mine, no? And where is Mr. Berkshire? The party is about to begin and the guest of honor is nowhere to be found. Mr. Berkshire will be here soon. I am talking to him on the phone right now. Oh, hello, mm. Mr. Berkshire. Pierre says hello. Mr. Berkshire sent me to check and make sure everything is ready. <laughs> you are talking to moi. Pierre Stamos, event planner of the year, three years running. Everything will be magnifique. Yes, sir. It looks like we are all set. Mm-hmm. Purple, it looks beautiful. Pierre, keep working. Oh. All right, gather around everyone. Team meeting, hurry, chop, chop, let's go. All right, the guests are all gathered in the lobby. And when we open those doors, let's give them some magic. Now, Miranda, you're gonna be stationed in the checking counter. You need to make sure that everyone on the list has an RSVP. Do you think you can handle that? Uh-huh. Good. Mr. Piano Man, keep it classy. All right, places, people. We open doors in five, four, three, two, one. Showtime. Hi, I hope I'm not too early. I believe in being punctual. I guess it's just the teacher in me. Be in your seat by the time the bell rings. RSVP? Oh, yes, um, here it is. Name? Nadine Hooper. Ah, yes, Hooper, welcome. Are you a friend of Mr. Berkshire? Um, no. I have no idea why I received the invitation, but I am honored to be here. Following us to table two. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. John Matthews. Oh, and since I couldn't find a babysitter, this is my daughter, Megan. Hi. Remember, dear, seen and not heard. Yes, welcome. We hope you enjoy the evening. You will be seated at table one. Yeah. I'm a personal friend of Robert Berkshire and a big donor to all of his charities, so we'll be seated wherever we want. But... We'll be at the head table. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Thompson. You will be seated at table two. 
Hello. Is this the Berkshire Gala? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Here's my golden ticket. This must be the social event of the year because I was invited. Will there be media tonight? How's my lipstick? Looks lovely, Mrs. St. Clair. Oh, that's Ms. St. Clair. Lizzie St. Clair. Pierre Stamos. How are you, darling? And what would a gala event be without you? Well, nothing. And where is Mr. St. Clair? We are no longer together. Ooh, I'm sorry, but that sounds like some juicy gossip. Yes, but I don't think I can ever forgive him for what he did. Table three. I'll seat her. Lead on, Pierre. When the paparazzi get here, make sure they shoot me from my good side. <laughs> RSVP? Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Jones, too. Uh, table three. Pierre? Yes? There is someone sitting at the head table. Well, yes, isn't it lovely? No one is to be seated at the head table. And why not? Mr. Berkshire gave explicit instruction that he alone will decide who sits at the head table. I'm on it. Miranda, 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 Miranda! Hey, pasta! Why are they sitting at the head table? I tried to tell them, sir, but he refused. Oh, must I do everything around here? Well, I've been a teacher for about six years. I'm very passionate about educating the next generation. As William Shakespeare wrote, ignorance is the curse of God, but knowledge is the wings wherewith we fly to heaven. Uh, excuse me, sir? Doctor. Ha, <laughs> doctor. Uh, I believe you are seated at table number one. I can help look, you find- Look, look, let's not cause a scene here. Robert and I are friends. We play golf. I think he'd want us to sit here. Well, I assure you, but we're, we're, we're done here. Bye-bye. Oh, and some hors d'oeuvres, please. <laughs> chop, chop. The help here is pathetic. Tell me about it. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Resikavich. You are at table four. Well, I love the school where I work, except for this one coworker. She's the lunch line lieutenant. Ugh, loud, obnoxious, a real bully. I am so glad she was not invited tonight. <gasps> ah! Watch what you're doing. This dress is priceless and now it's wet. Come Prende. I'm so sorry. Your apology is not accepted. Shoo, Andale. <sighs> Lizzie, me. I am so sorry. I'm working with a new crew tonight. They're not very good. Well, a few minor problems, sir. Also, it appears that we have several no-shows. Yes, sir, right away. Pierre, Mr. Berkshire would like a word. <gasps> oh, hello, Mr. Berkshire. <laughs> yes, everything is going swimmingly. Why, yes, there are several little empty seats, but I can assure you they will be filled. Uh, yes, sir. Here, here she is, for you. Miranda, give me that! Is everything okay? Guests are missing! Yes, I know! Why? I don't know! Right away, sir. He wants reasons. <laughs> Excuse me? Not excuses, reasons why there are no shows. And how are we supposed to know that? Mr. Berkshire has spent a fortune on this banquet, and he's quite disappointed that it is not filled. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I promised fabulous, and I delivered fabulous. It is not my problem if people had better things to do with their time. Pierre, find out why the guests are not here, and please don't make a scene. <laughs> Miranda, you heard her. Call everyone on that list and find out why they're not here. But... No more buts. Chop the chop. Sir, I'm afraid I must ask you to take your assigned seat. Fine, but he's not getting any donations from me tonight, especially not to any political party. He knows how I feel about politics. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Mr. Berkshire, I would like to welcome you to tonight's gala event. He will be arriving soon, and he would like you all to know what a great honor it is that you came tonight. Dinner will be served soon. Good, I'm starving. But as you can see, we are still waiting on a few more guests. Thank you for your patience and please enjoy the hors d'oeuvres and the music. 
In the New Testament book of Luke, Luke 14, it's a story about who belongs at the table. Who belongs at God's table? This is what it says, verse 1. It happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely, and there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Now, most likely, the reason why the writer mentions the word dropsy is because of an ancient teaching that said that this disease was actually caused by immoral living, sort of like a sexually transmitted disease in our day. And it's quite possible that the the Pharisees actually planted this man in Jesus' story to see if he would violate the Sabbath day law and heal him on this day. Because for sure, this man was not invited to eat there. That's why verse 4 says Jesus healed him and then sent him away because he wasn't invited to this table. He was considered to be riffraff. Then in verse 7 it says, as Jesus began to speak the parable, he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor around the table. Now, a little cultural context will help you understand. In that day, the arrangement for a formal banquet was known as a triclinium. You might picture a lavish courtyard, an open courtyard, where a lot of people were gathered around to watch because these banquets, these feasts were like community events. People would actually come from the town just to watch people eat. They were very, very lavish. And there in the courtyard would be a very low table with three low couches at the head of the table. Now, who do you think got to sit on the couches at the head of the table? The, The important people, right? the Pharisees, and the scribes. So if you were a big deal, you got to sit at one of these three sofas. If you were kind of important, you got to stay around and eat some food. And if you weren't important at all, you weren't invited, you had to stand outside the courtyard and peek in and watch this whole event unfold. That's where the man with dropsy was standing. Well, Jesus sees this arrangement. This is what he says in verse 12. He says, look, when you give a dinner... Do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, now catch this, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Now, is Jesus really saying that we should never invite our relatives over for dinner? Well, yes, it says it right here in the scripture. Some of you have been looking for this verse your whole life, and you finally found it right here at Phoenix First. No, it's not saying that, all right? (laughs) Jesus' point is simply this. What usually happens at one of these big banquets is people think, hey, it's all about me. And how do I get the best seat of honor at this table? And if I'm rich, I'll invite my other rich friends and family members so that one day they can reciprocate and return the favor. And Jesus says this, your table is not to be restricted to a list of people that you think of as being beautiful or strategic or important. Then Jesus talks about who should be invited to the table. I love this. Again, context is very helpful here. One of these religious groups of Jesus' day was called the Essene. They focused a lot on purity. They believed that if a person had a blemish in their body, a handicap or an illness or a sickness, it was because of sin in their life, because of impurity. And so some of them actually withdrew to a, to a place in the desert, formed a community, and drew up a list of those who would be invited to God's banquet one day and then those who would be excluded. And among those who would be excluded were, they wrote down, the crippled, the lame, the mute, the blind, the deaf, and those with any physical blemish in their body. And now we have Jesus, God's son, giving precisely a list. He says, look, no, when you give a banquet, your table, your life, your heart is to include people that you've been taught by religion should be excluded by God. The poor, the crippled, the lame the blind, the diseased, the outcasts of your society. And when you do that, he says, the kingdom of God is actually breaking through from heaven to earth by excluding all these tacky people, all these riffraff, all these dweebs. Because the truth is, every one of us are dweebs. Every one of us do not deserve a place at God's table. Understand, he's holy, we're not. 
but he says, come as you are. Then he tells him one of the greatest stories about what God's kingdom is really like. Let me read it to you. A certain man was preparing a great banquet, and he invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, come now, for everything is ready. The banquet is ready. But they all like began to make excuses. What do you think those excuses were like? Hey, when are you serving dinner? It's getting late. Uh -huh. Shortly, sir. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we're through now. Uh, bye bye. All right, we have called all those who are missing, and this is what we found. Mr. and Mrs. George said that someone has finally made an offer on their house, and they had to run and sign the closing papers immediately. Well, that seems like a reasonable excuse. And Donald Jamison? Uh, he bought a new sports car and is out enjoying the open road. Vroom, vroom. The Sanderson's dog, Rex, is in labor and has been delivering puppies for the past half hour. Rex? That sounds like a male dog. A <laughs> surprise. <laughs> and the Higleys? Apparently, Mrs. Higley doesn't like for Mr. Higley to be at outings, or there may be other beautiful women. And to quote Mr. Higley, I have a wife now, so I can't come. <sighs> hey, keep it classy. There are dozens of other excuses. Would you like to hear them? No. Mr. Berkshire is determined that nothing will stop his party. What can we do? <laughs> I don't know. Let's just go out in the streets and grab people all willy-nilly. <laughs> That's a great idea. Invite anyone who will come and get them here quickly. I will tell Mr. Berkshire. Uh, no, 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 no. That, that would be a disaster. And my, my reputation is at stake. I will not have this event turned into some kind of Sackis! Fine. Miranda? I'll help. I love a circus. Great. Take your waiters and fill this place. Yes, ma'am. Hey, when do we eat? Hey, pipe down, Bob. Dinner's delayed. Now, look, this is an edgy story that Jesus is telling. This, this host blows a lot of money on a big feast, a big banquet. And in that day, the invitation process had two stages. First of all, the host would let people know way in advance what day the, the party or the banquet was going to be on. And he would ask the, the guests to invite or ask the guests to commit to actually being there. So the host would know how much food and, and uh, drink to buy. We, we do this in our day. What are the four letters at the bottom of an invitation? RSVP, that's right. So this has already happened in Jesus' story. RSVPs have already been sent in. Now, the host can't put on the invitation, come at 6 o'clock. Why not? Well, there's no clocks in those days. So what would happen is, on the day of the feast, the host would send out the servant to make the announcement, everybody come now. Preparations are complete. The feast is ready. The banquet is ready. And so the servant does this. But the same people who have already RSVP'd start to bail on him. And you have to understand that the excuses that Jesus throws out there uh, are bogus excuses. And everyone in that culture listening would have known that these are bogus excuses. Uh, the first guy says, look, I bought a field and I got to go out and look at it. That would be like saying in our day, look, I, I bought a new house and I got to go see what's inside of it, you know. It's a bogus excuse. The second guy says, I bought five oxen, and I got to go try them out. Again, that would be like saying in our day, I, I bought a new car, and I got to go see if there's a, an engine under the hood. You know, it, it's a bogus excuse. The third guy says, well, I've just gotten married. And of course, he would have known his wedding date way back when he RSVP'd. These are illegitimate excuses. What's happening in the story? Don't miss this. Here's what's happening. This is a deliberate attempt on the part of these invited, committed guests to snub the host. They are refusing to come to his party. And not only are they refusing to come to his party, they know that they are the A-list invitees. And if they don't come, there ain't going to be no party. 
all the chairs will be empty. Jesus is telling this story to religious leaders who are sitting around this table. He himself is the servant sent by God to make the announcement. The kingdom of God has now come. I'm here. Preparations are complete. Repent and believe the good news. Follow me. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus. Who are the people who are refusing to come to his party? It's the religious people sitting around the table, and he's looking at them right in the face. Things are heating up. They know exactly what he's talking about. Who is standing in the courtyard watching this whole thing? It's the riffraff. It's the dweebs. It's the outcasts, people who would never be invited to a party like this. And both groups are thinking to themselves at this point, this party's over. No one's coming. The A-list, they're not coming. Jesus' ministry is done. It's over. No one's coming to his party. Then Jesus says something extraordinary. See, this is why I love Jesus so much. The master is determined that nothing is going to stop his party. And he says something in verse 22, 21. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly. In other words, this is an emergency. Go out quickly. Nothing should trump this priority in your life. Then he says, go quickly into the streets. Now, the streets you would expect, right? That's where all the nice homes are and nice people are. But then he says, no, go into the streets and the alleys of the town. Who lives in the alleys? All the wrong people. All the outcasts. All the dweebs. People who cannot, cannot possibly reciprocate. Nobody goes out and blows a lot of money on a party and then fills up the guest list with people from the alleys. But the master does. Because this is Jesus' way. He says, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in who? The poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. He says, bring in the dweebs. Bring in the outcasts, because these are my kind of people. The servant replies, Master, I am all over this. I'm on this like a rat on a Cheeto, man. I am on this. I've been out there storming the streets. I've been out there in invitation mode like you wouldn't believe. Sir, what you've ordered has been done, but there's still room at the table. And by the way, that's why you and I are here today. Because God still had room at his table for us, outcasts, sinners, messes like you and I. What does that tell you about God's table? He's got a massive table. His table is huge and radically inclusive. And he wants everyone around his table. So the master says, well, send him out again. It's unthinkable that we all sit here and enjoy all this wonderful food and, and fellowship while there's still room at my table. Go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel, that's a strong word, compel them to come in. Now, this does not mean to force them against their will. This was badly misunderstood by the early church when they went on the crusades. Remember that? And they told people, convert or die. That was not what he was talking about here. But you have to understand etiquette in that culture. If you were at the bottom of the social scale and you got invited to a lavish feast by a wealthy master, you would just assume that he was just being polite to you. And so the thing to do would be to decline. You know, he's great, I'm not. He's rich, I'm not. I would feel totally out of place at a banquet like that. So I appreciate the invitation. I want a copy of the invitation to show my friends I got one and all that, but he's just being polite. No, thank you. Well, the master knew what they would be thinking. So he said, look, don't take no for an answer. Keep going, keep searching, keep looking for anyone who will respond. And, and when they respond and they make all these excuses as to why they can't come, take them by the arm, smile and say, nah, you're coming, come on, come with me. If you have to, pick them up and carry them all the way here. But I want them here. And then verse 23 says, so that my house may be full so that there's not a single chair left empty at my banquet, so that there's not a single mansion left vacant in heaven, so that my house may be full. And friends, God's got a really big 
house. Okay, it's about 64, and I have to check that off my list. Okay, they're here. Oh, great. The circus has arrived. Kind guests, please know that whatever happens next, don't blame me. Where did you find them? From cafes, buses, uptown, downtown, city hall, back alleys, the highways and the byways. Ugh. Very good. Sir, they are here. Are you sure about this? This is career suicide. Think about your reputation. My reputation rests on how well I serve Mr. Berkshire. Okay, Miranda, you're on. Okay, chop chop, team meeting. Now the guests are gathered in the lobby, and when we open those doors, let's give them some magic. Pierre, you will be stationed at the check-in counter. Make sure every person is given a big welcome. Can you do that? <laughs> yes. Uh-huh, good. Mr. Piano Man, keep it fun. Okay, places, people. We open those doors in five, four, three, two, one. Showtime. Woo! Wow! Look at this fancy, smancy shindig! How you doing there, Mr. Fancy Pants? Give me a big hug. Mm. Can you please park your car outside? No! This is everything I own. Just keep your nasty paws off my stuff. Ain't she a peach? She kind of smells. Oh, but she's got a heart of gold. Hey, are you serving up cheese doodles? I love cheese doodles. You'll be seated in the back alley with the rats. You'll feel right at home. Pierre, make them feel welcome. Right this way, sir. Thanks for the invite, Pierre. It means a lot. I did not invite you. Equal rights now! Equal rights now! Equal rights now! Excuse me, this is a classy event, not some sort of protest rally. If you want social change, you gotta make some noise. The 99% must be heard. Yeah! yeah. When do we eat dinner? We've been protesting for hours. Uh, well. Equal rights now! Equal rights now! Equal rights now! Hmm, so is this where the free food is? Skinny man. Uh, excuse me, there's no need for insults. Don't you tell me about what's not necessary because, oh, where's my table? Uh, it's over there. I will mess you up, twig boy. <laughs> now where's the food? It's coming. In my cafeteria, things run on time. They don't call me lunch line lieutenant for nothing. Oh no, there she is, hyping. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Oh. Well, 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 if it isn't the Geek Squad from the Nerd Convention. Well, 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 if it isn't a snarky little maitre d', the Green Goblin, my Spider-Man. It's called Comic-Con, where yeah. nerds rule. Checkmate, Bazinga. <laughs> Come, Lord Vader. Let's find a seat. Yo, yo, yo! There ain't no popo up in here, is there? In English. The cops, yo. <laughs> this ain't some kind of police thing, is it? Y'all gotta be suspicious of free stuff. Everything's got a price. Uh, apparently thugs are allowed as well. Yo, being a thug ain't easy. Come on in, Snoop Doggy. Thanks for having me. Oh, finally, someone who looks respectable. What line of work are you in, sir? Politics. I spoke too soon. I had a breakdown at City Hall. I thought I'd swing on by and see what all the commotion was about. Thought it might be a good place to press the flash with new voters. Re-election's in two months. Hey, hey, hey. Is this here the redneck barbecue? Oh, great. If it isn't the honey boo-boo. No. <laughs> That's my cousin. I'm Bunny Foo Foo. And will the rest of the trailer park be joining you? Oh, no. They are busy. There's a duct tape sale at Walmart. That's it! I give up! Come on in, everybody. Prostitutes, pimps, orphans, drug dealers. Why should there be any standard for admittance? There. What is going on here? Isn't this beautiful? Such a wonderful mix of people. These people should not be mixing. 
Well, this is what Mr. Berkshire asked for. I know Robert personally, and I know he would not want this. Sounds like you may not know him as well as you think you do. Oh, and what would a crazy old man know about that? Hey, don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah, or a purse by its duct tape. Hey, your daddy's a doctor, right? Look, I got this corn on my foot and it has been driving me nuts. Hey! You think it can help? Stay away from my daughter. But daddy, she needs help from a doctor. Honey, not everyone deserves our help. She chose a life on the streets and she can deal with the consequences. Lindsay, did you see who showed up? I know. Do you think he saw me? Do you want me to sneak you out the back so, mm, entrance? No. Maybe it's better if we do see each other. <laughs> You work at my school. You mean our school. Yeah, yeah, you teachers, you always think you work at New York or you run the schools, but it's people like me, the lunch lady that really makes things run. Just like these waiters. You don't give them no respect. We respect you, okay? Yeah, you say that, but you treat us like we are the help. Oh, 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 did you, did you? You got a problem with me? Come on, Come on, let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I don't fight. Yeah, yeah, you don't fight, but I got to fight for everything because there's people out there to get me, and you ain't getting it because you got to get into, you got to get into the getting to get good. You got it. Oh, why do you have to be such a bully? No one is out to get you. Are you calling me a victim? Life has been hard on me, sister. What are you looking at, old man? I know I used to feel that way, but life can be cruel to victims. The trick is not to see yourself as one. What do you mean by that? It's been, great talk. it's been really great talking with you guys. Vote for me in the next election, okay? Politicians are crooks. You're like Rob Ford, arrogant, entitled, and corrupt. Look, I'm not even sure you're old enough to vote, but I appreciate that you're exercising your right to free speech and that you seem to be passionate about making sure that other people are tolerant of your views. Don't question our tolerance. I don't. Just your ability to tolerate those who disagree with you. Howdy, Darth. <laughs> Did you see my duct tape purse? You know, duct tape is like the force. There's a light side and a dark side. And it holds the whole universe together. You intrigue me, Miss Foo Foo. I never thought I would be saying this to somebody of questionable intelligence, but would you consider joining our coalition of science fiction admirers? <laughs> well, slap the dog and spit on the fire, let's be BFFs. <laughs> Wait, so that's your job? You're oppressing women. That's right. I know, and that makes me hate myself. But how many options you got when you living in the hood? You got gang, baby daddy, pimp. I chose door number three. Well, what did you want to do? Teacher. I'm a teacher. What did you want to teach? Art, painting. I was real good at graffiti. But my mom, she'd be like, that's the thugs. <laughs> yeah, I said that too. So I left home. I was homeless. And when you're desperate, you do desperate stuff. Oh, I I'm sorry. I just wish I'd get a second chance. Well, maybe I can help. Maybe we both can help. You would do that? Hello, Lindsay. Richard, don't fall for it. He's just here to drum up votes for his next election. At first, I was. But now I see the real reason I was supposed to be here. Lindsay, I was wrong. You're just sorry you got caught. No, actually, I've been trying to figure out a way to turn things around and come clean, apologize. That affair broke my heart, Richard. Do you think you could ever forgive me? I wouldn't forgive him. I would. I think he means it. This is preposterous. You tell Richard Berkshire that if this riffraff isn't cast out, we will go home. I agree. Tell him it's either us or them. 
There. Stay out of it, old man. Sir, I'm happy to announce your banquet is almost filled. Thank you, Alina. I see everyone's here, and it's a beautiful sight. Wait, 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 wait. You are Mr. Berkshire. In the flesh. But you're all filthy and smelly. Surprise! Don't let appearances fool you, Pierre. Elena, thank you for keeping our little secret. My pleasure, sir. Fascinating. This is like undercover boss meets secret millionaire. <laughs> Folks, I am so honored that you are willing to join us tonight. Please hang out, mingle, enjoy each other's company. Dinner will be served soon. Berkshire, what kind of joke is this? Why are you con concealing your true self? You're the wealthiest man in town. Well, perhaps that image was concealing my true self. So for the last few days, I did this little experiment. I shed that image so that I could blend in with the community, experience their world. I did some soul searching, and you know, I realized that everyone here is different that we need to show compassion. But this is undignified and repulsive. I know, isn't it great? Oh. Okay, so who's gonna sit at the head table? Society's outcasts? That is a great idea. Oh, I, I can't believe this, I can't. Sir, this. might I remind you that this is his banquet and he can invite whoever he likes. Listen, we deserve better. Remember, you were invited, but not entitled. This is a disgrace. I cannot be in the same room as these people. But we are all the same. We are not all the same. Social status evolved for a reason, so that the strong could survive. Survival of the fittest. And uh, the most stylish. None of us is strong, Pierre. We all need someone to show us understanding. Give us a second chance. What, do you want to invite them all to the table? They will mess it up. Well, that's possible. But look, Pierre, walls are falling down. Prejudices are melting. Rifts are healing. All I see is the island of misfit toys. So I officially resign. I hoped you would Help me to serve them, Pierre. But if you can't, there's the door. Yeah, like my daddy says, don't let it hit you where the good Lord spit you. Thank you all for filling my banquet. It's an honor to have you as my guests. Now, this may look like an odd mix, but this is our community. Now, before dinner's served, we have a challenge for you. Under your plate is an envelope, and in it is a decision. You may be seated by those you may not like or understand, but are you willing to enlarge your circle of acceptance, of compassion, of forgiveness, of love? Honey, let's go, we're leaving. But Daddy, I wanna stay. Hey, Doc, you can sit by me. Can we eat yet? We are almost there. This service will go just a few minutes over today.
And I hope and pray you'll stay to the very end because you're going to be so blessed by the final conclusion of this story today. But I love the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 14. I love it so much. I love how the master didn't just wait for people to come to his banquet, but he actually went out and searched them out. Because that's my story. And that's your story. That while we were a mess, while we were in our sin, Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, went out and sought us, invited us into his table. In fact, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, that's when Christ died for us. Isn't that amazing? He, he saw us at our worst point, and he still loved us. What an amazing story that is. For 30 years, this church has been like the master. We have been out there in search mode, trying to find people to invite in to the family of God. It was about 25 years ago when we were holding a, a big pageant here during the Easter services. Back in those days, we did the full-on pageant with the crucified Christ and the blood and all the stuff, you know, and, the, and uh, it was, you know, very, very dramatic, almost like you'd see in a, in a movie, The Passion of the Christ. And on this certain day, it was, it was Easter, and we were just getting ready to open the curtains to reveal Christ hanging on the cross between the two thieves. But backstage, a crisis was happening because they couldn't find one of the thieves. He was lost. He was gone. And back in those days, on Sunday mornings, we used to bust in a lot of people from the streets who were homeless, and they would sit in the auditorium. Sometimes they would get lost. They would kind of walk around. Sometimes they would come drunk, you know, and they were walking around. On this particular day, one man got lost, and he found himself in the backstage where all the cast was. And the head of the cast was running around frantically, where's the thief? Where's the thief? Where's the thief? We can't find the thief. And he sees this man who's dressed you know, in, in tattered clothes. And he said, well, are you the thief? And the guy's like, well, I've stolen. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm a thief. Before this guy knew it, they had his clothes ripped off, a loincloth around him, and they put him up on the cross. When the curtains open, like three minutes later, he's hanging on the cross in front of 6,000 people. And when my dad said those lines, and the thief cried out to Jesus, Father, forgive me. He literally cried out, Father, forgive me. Forgive me for my sin. He was saved right there on the cross on Easter Sunday. The true story. And, you know, we were here at Dream Conference. One of these stuffy old religious pastors said, you know, what kind of a church is this? After hearing that story. And we said, this is the kind of church where real thieves hang on crosses on Easter Sunday. And they say sinner's prayers, and they get redeemed on Easter Sunday. That's what kind of church we have. See, that, that, that's the kind of church that God's called us to build. Not a snooty, high-flying church where we just want the elite to come. Everyone's welcome. We know that. But the Bible says the New Testament church, the rich and the poor, they had all things in common. And they came together and they worshiped together. Aren't you proud of our church? That's the kind of church that Jesus died for. Amen. Now here's the deal. Our church has to continue to be in search mode. The thing that made this church great was my dad's leadership early on, going out and being in search mode. We can never lose that. We gotta get out there and be in search mode for every single person who's far from God. Because the truth is, one day, one day, you didn't have a seat at the table. But somebody loved you enough to tell you about Jesus and to pray for you and to invite you in. And you responded to the invitation. And today you know your seat is secure around the table. And there's so many more outside these walls, friends, who would respond to the invitation if they just know that they're invited. Let's invite them to the table. Now, right now you can take out your invitation. For all the rebels who have not yet opened their invitations, you can open them now. And inside, you're going to see a circle of a crown of thorns. This is my invitation to you today. Would you let God change your heart today? Because there are people who are still outside of your circle of love. Maybe family members who have betrayed you. You just don't like them. Maybe it's certain political groups. Maybe it's people who are on the wrong side of the fence. But today, could all of us just say, you know what, there's, 
there's not one person on this planet that doesn't matter to God. So they need to matter to me. And would you write down their names in your circle of love? Let the thorns remind you that you were once outside that, that circle. But God invited you in. And then you can take this home with you. Put it on your desk at work as a reminder that God invited you and you responded to the table. So while they sing this song right now and they could complete this portion of the, of the drama, um, I want you to write down those names. Just seal it up and take it home with you and be reminded that you were once outside the family of God and you were invited in. And let this song remind you of what our church is supposed to be all about, okay? that Jesus Christ came to build.
And you know what? The picture is not quite complete yet. There's still room at his table for you. Part of the reason why we did this message is because it, it reinforces the vision of our church, but also for those who are not yet part of the family of God. Today is your invitation to join the family of God. God's heart is huge. His table is massive. And no matter what you've done or where you've been, how far you've strayed, the invitation's been given out today. He says, come just the way that you are. You can't clean up your mess on your own, but when my spirit takes up residence in your life, things will change. And if you'll trust me, if you'll trust me, I'll take care of the rest. So the invitation's been given out today by God. Will you respond to it? Well, I want to thank you for joining us online today. You know, a question that a lot of people ask us is, how do you begin a relationship with Jesus Christ? And we like to call it the ABCs of committing our life to the Lord. Uh, a just simply stands for acknowledge. Acknowledge in your heart that you uh, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The B stands for believe. Believe that Christ died for your sins personally. And then C, confess your sins to the Lord. I want to encourage you today to do that, to acknowledge Jesus Christ being the Son of God, to believe in your heart that He is the Lord, that He died for your sins. And then right now, can I lead you in a prayer where you can confess your sins to the Lord and begin a relationship with Jesus Christ? Would you just say these words with me? Just say, Heavenly Father, I come before you today because of Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross. Thank you for your great love for me. I wanna follow you with all my heart. I wanna be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. And so today I confess my sins. I've made mistakes, I have sinned, and I give my heart to you. Thank you for hearing my prayer and for forgiving my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says the moment you pray that prayer and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, He hears that prayer and He forgives you and you begin a brand new life with Jesus Christ. I'd encourage you, if you don't have a church, man, find a church, get involved, and uh, start using your gifts in that church. Be a part of that church community. If you're in the Phoenix area here, we'd love to have you worship the Lord with us here and join our, our family here. So there's a little card there on your uh, menu button that says Get Connected. Just click that. Fill that out and uh, we'll respond to you ASAP. Or if you have prayer requests, please uh, hit the prayer request button and that goes immediately to our prayer ministry uh, and they will pray for you, pray for your needs. But uh, the most important thing is to get involved in a church that really loves Jesus Christ and uh, teaches the Word of God. God bless you and uh, we rejoice with you in your new life with Jesus Christ.